Now that Magret Garlic has been replaced with Agnes Knit in the Lonker Witch Trio, you would expect Terry Pratchett to have a whole host of new adventures prepared with a new team of witches. However, this is the only adventure Agnes has as an official member of the Lonker Coven. Why is this? Well, first we have to answer, what is Carpe Jugulum? It is a joyous day in Lonker, for King Varence and Queen Magrat have been blessed with a new baby, and the whole kingdom is invited to the child's naming ceremony, as are dignitaries from other neighboring kingdoms. However, one such group of dignitaries happens to be the Magpire family of Ubervald, a royal family of vampires. And as you know, once a vampire has been invited into a house, they love to lounge about and act like they own the place. Count Magpire and his family take this trope somewhat more literally, though, as they fully intend to own the place, hypnotizing the residents of Lonker and forcibly integrating the place into the Magpire's vampiric fiefdom. Thankfully, the young witch Agnes Knit's split personality allows her to resist the vampire's hypnotism, but can she gather up the other Lonker witches to defend their home against the vampiric invaders? Well, we'll just have to see. How does the world of Carpe Jugulum work? Carpe Jugulum introduces quite a lot of new world building to the disc. This is the book where instead of a stage persona, Perdita X Dream becomes a full-on split personality for Agnes. Varence and Magret's daughter, Esmeralda Margaret, note spelling of Lonker, is introduced. And this is the first book to feature the Knack Mac Fiegel, who are only present for a brief gag in Carpe Jugulum, but will go on to become mainstays in later Discworld novels. They're basically a cross between Braveheart and the Smurfs, being diminutive, blue-skinned, picked seas, who love nothing more than fighting and drinking and having a grand old time. Alongside this, while it had technically appeared back in Witches Abroad, Carpe Jugulum is the book where Uberwald is properly introduced. It is a loving tribute to classic Universal and Hammer Horror movies, where every scientist is of the mad variety, every castle is ruled by some sort of aristocratic monster, and lightning strikes every time someone makes a grand proclamation. The Magpire family is one such group of aristocratic monsters living in Don't Go Near the Castle and ruling over the peasantry with an iron fist. Of course, they don't see themselves that way. To Count Magpire, humans are merely cattle who should be grateful to be ruled by the enlightened and evolved vampiric race and he has set about training himself and his children to overcome traditional vampire weaknesses, such as crossing running water, religious symbols, or spilt beans. No, that is an actual thing, look it up, I swear. This is in stark contrast to the old Count, who never tried to hide that he was a bloodthirsty monster, but only ever targeted adventurous females over the age of 17 who looked good in a nightdress, and always gave them a fighting chance to kill him. After which he was more than happy to spend the next few decades as a pile of ashes before coming back and starting the whole game up again. The new Count has been in charge for so long now though that about the only one who remembers the good old days is the Igor who serves the Magpire family, and was a dutiful assistant to the old Count. Of all the ideas Pratchett created for Uberwald, the concept of Igor's is easily the one he had the most fun with, as he would revisit it again and again for the rest of the series. It turns out that those hunchbacked, scar-covered assistants you see in horror movies all come from a single family. All of them are named Igor, except the girls, and they all have a strict code of conduct, which causes Igor to butt heads frequently with the new Count. Yes, perhaps these new-fangled ideas of villainy are more cunning and crafty, but at least with the old ways no one got seriously hurt. Of course, you can't have a hammer horror tribute without a holy man, and while the Omnian priest mightily oats might not seem very holy, or very much of anything being rather a drip, by the end of the story he manages to find his faith and rise to the occasion. Which leads to the question, what does Carpe Jugulum have to say? Mightily oats is an Omnian priest experiencing a crisis of faith. It's not that he doesn't have faith, just that he wants something more than faith some unmistakable sign from Om that he is right. He has studied ancient languages and out-of-print scripture, but all this has done is give him knowledge, which highlights how certain gospel passages bear more than a passing resemblance to non-Omnian legends or even scientific phenomenon. Oates wanted knowledge to strengthen his faith, but all it really did was strengthen his doubt. According to Granny Weatherwax, though, that doubt is a necessary component for any belief system because systems are, by their very nature, based on rules and regulations. And for every rule, there is an exception. 
For every regulation, there is a loophole. For every system, there is a person who doesn't fit or an event no one thought to plan for, or something that confronts the rules and regulations that the system is built on. And if we can adapt to these challenges to our faith, that is ultimately what makes us good people. Because the alternative to adapting is to steamroll over anything or anyone that doesn't fit our neat and tidy view of the world. Oats may want certainty, but that certainty will come with a steep price, because complete and utter certainty can lead one to commit violent and dangerous acts. Indeed, that is what ultimately separates the old and new Count Magpires. While the old Count held no illusions about his monstrosity and respected the people he ruled over as well as any blood-drinking hellbeast could, the new Count believes that he is doing humans a favor by turning them into hypnotized cattle. The new Count is certain that what he does is right. Now, again, as with small gods, Pratchett is careful not to make some sort of blanket statement like, all religion is bad. Diehard atheism can be just as dangerous as diehard religious dogmatism, because both belief systems reject any doubting or questioning, and both rely on what Grating Weatherwax deems treating people as things. But as we learned with Lilith Weatherwax in Witches Abroad, devotion to the supposed cause is less important than to the desired effect. Mightily Oaths may save the day by embracing his faith, but this embrace comes hand in hand with accepting the doubt that must come with it. Final Verdict The central issue with Carpe Jugulum is that it's supposed to be our first story with a new Lanka Witch trio, with Agnes replacing Magrat and creating a new team dynamic. However, Magrat doesn't really leave the team. Sure, her participation in this adventure is framed as one last ride for old time's sake, but that still means Magret is an active participant in the story. In order for Agnes to be accepted by the audience as the new member of the Longer Witch Trio, Magret cannot be involved in any of the adventure. Readers were already going to compare Agnes to Magret, so having Magret actually in the story with Agnes only fuels that comparison, and exacerbates any dissatisfaction readers might have had with Agnes replacing her. Agnes does get a really nice subplot, her romance with Vlad de Magpire being a well-done deconstruction of the romance between Bella Swan and Edward Cullen, despite predating that book by almost a decade. But even if Agnes is a good character, she isn't Magrat. And you can be the sweetest, ripest apple on the planet, but people will still not like you if they are used to oranges. And that's exactly the problem with this book. Carpe Jugulum feels like Terry Pratchett wanted to move the Longer Witch books in a new direction, but found it harder than expected, and so decided to abandon the endeavor. It's not bad, far from it, I would give it an 8 out of 10, but as befitting the silver era of Discworld, it feels like Pratch decided to take the easier path and get the old game back together, despite the whole point of this book arguably being to test out the new gang and new team dynamic. And this is the last of the Lonker Witch books. While we see Lonker and the Witches again in later works, after Carpe Jugulum, we never again get to see a story centered on the old witch trio, or even the new one. Like with The Last Continent, Carpe Jugulum serves almost as a goodbye. And while I view the Silver Era of Discworld as a sort of creative plateau, upon revisiting Carpe Jugulum, I'm wondering if a better description of it is that it's like an extended moving pictures. Sir Terry has said and done about all that he's wanted to say and do with the New World, so... Maybe it's time for him to make an even newer world. What we see in these six books, then, is just that transition period. And on the subject of goodbyes, this novel is the last of the Discworld audiobooks, to be narrated by Nigel Planer. For those of you who don't listen to audiobooks, this might not mean very much, but when you invest yourself in a series as long as Discworld, the books become almost like family to you. And I don't know Nigel Planer, I've never met him, and I don't know the first thing about him, but his distinctive voice was as much a part of my Discworld experience as any other aspect of the books. 
So, for me at least, this book was especially bittersweet. Because I was saying goodbye to the voice who made these books for me. Stephen Briggs would serve as a talented and capable replacement for Planer, but even so, I would just like to take this moment to thank Nigel Planer for giving the Discord audiobooks that extra color of magic that they needed. As for me, I'm Marco Keen, signing off, and I hope you like this video. If you did, and you would like to see me make more, please leave a like or comment down below, share my video via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or other means, and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you would like to help this channel out, I have a Patreon, which you can contribute to via the link in the description. If you sign up, you'll get sweet bonuses like an internet hug, early access to videos, and the ability to vote in polls to help me decide which works to have next. Also, also, if I manage to get to 250 subscribers by the end of this year, that is 250 YouTube subscribers by January 1st, 2022, I will play and stream Dragon Quest V for you all. Let's do this, people! Don't make me grab you by the throat! Thank you all, and I will see you in the next one.